Greetings, all. It's Max, and we're back. And you know me, I just love asking questions with all these deep doctrines here. I want to get back into this dispensation thing because apparently I was all messed up on what dispensations actually are. Um, for the most part, what I gather is people actually sort of, uh, I would call it hyper dispensationalism. But I've come to find out that most people that teach dispensations as a rule teach it uh, a certain way, like the Larkin way. For instance, where we have not being able to reconcile the book of James in the New Testament, so we're going to push that off into the future and say that the future is saved by faith plus works because James says so. And we're going to go push it even further to say that all of the books written to the Jews are for the tribulation period. Um, I think that's silly. But... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the question out there. Now, I'm not going to get into the Old Testament. I've given that some, uh, I just let it be. When people say, oh, the Jews faith, saved by faith and works, faith and works. You can believe that all you want to, but if you believe that Jews were saved by faith plus works, what is their faith doing? They're not doing anything for them. It's The Jews would be saved by works then. That would be what saves them. Anytime that you mix faith and works, you're saying that you're saved by works. Also, you're saying, in the case of the Old Testament, that it is impossible for the Gentiles to be saved at all. That is a fundamental character of God problem, in my eyes. In my eyes. But I digress. We're not going to talk about the Old Testament today. We're going to talk about the New Testament. And that apparently in the New Testament now, we have a faith work system after Christ has died for our sins, and rose again. Now, what do we know today about the gospel and the effect Jesus Christ has? Well, we know that Jesus Christ took all sin upon himself to forgive us our sins, be the payment for our sins, because we do not have the capacity to do so for ourselves. We needed a redeemer, someone else to do it. Jesus Christ did that, did all the work himself, and offers it as a free gift for anyone to receive. That's the character of God. That's the character of God. Now today, when someone wants to add works into the gospel, we call them a heretic and a blasphemer. A blasphemer because adding your own works onto Jesus Christ's works makes it seem like Jesus didn't do enough. And you're helping Jesus out by your works. I went to church every Saturday on Sabbath. You need to let me into heaven. It's blasphemy. Now, we go into this dispensational change of the tribulation, which, yes, I believe there's a dispensational change, our object of our faith may perhaps change. But is works part of the equation for people's salvation with these tribulation saints? Is there works involved? Now there is, of course, the mark of the beast. It says, any man take the mark. But that's all it says. That is all it says. And when you ask these people to explain how people are getting saved in the time of the tribulation... They don't know. You ask them, okay, your faith and works. What works do you need to do to get to heaven in the tribulation? They don't know. Don't take the mark of the beast. Well, is not doing something a work? Honest question. What works do you have to do? I don't know. I'm not going to be here. We're going to get raptured out. That's a cop-out. That's a total cop-out. What works are required for you to do in order to go to heaven? In there it says something about um, the tribulation saints who follow the works of the law and the faith in their hearts. Something to that effect. Okay, we know for a fact nobody in the Old Testament kept the law. Perfect. We know nobody is keeping it today or is able to. If people could keep the law, there would be no need for Jesus Christ. 
So what is that really saying? Are these spiritual saints? Like angels coming down, preaching to people? It's a question. Nobody knows. Or is it people in the time of tribulation, after the church is raptured out, the people left behind go, I heard about this thing. I think, the, I think God took them. And they flock to Christianity and they read the New Testament and they have faith and they follow Jesus Christ. Where are they supposed to find out what exact works they're supposed to do to be saved? They might hear the Mark of the Beast thing, maybe. But what exact works are they supposed to do? Now, a bigger question is, Remember we mentioned how adding to the works of Jesus Christ is blasphemy? Not in the tribulation, apparently. You can add all the works you want. As a matter of fact, works in the tribulation is what saves you. Because obviously you wouldn't be doing any work if you didn't believe in God, right? Faith and works go hand in hand, because if you didn't believe in God, you certainly wouldn't be doing any works for him. So you are saying in the tribulation period you are saved by your own works, by your own self-righteousness. That is garbage. Garbage. Now, why do I have Hebrews up? Sorry, I'm getting a little upset. I had a whole, I had a whole study thing going, but you know, I go off the top of my head and get these questions out. Let's see. <clears throat> I think I covered what I want to with that. Yes, I'm going to move on to this other idea. And this came up in Scott Clark's video with these five different pastors, which, by the way, they all block me when I ask them questions. They're all very arrogant towards me. Um, I they, they, they insist that James is for that whole video was for James is actually referring to trip people in the tribulation. They have to do faith plus works, which means they just have to do works and they go to heaven. And I point out the fact to each one of these that James is talking to saved Jews. So saved Jews have a different gospel today, apparently, according to these guys, than everybody else. Oh no, but they're putting it they're putting it in the tribulation period. Well, if they're saved Jews, why wouldn't they be up with the rapture? It makes no sense. I, of course, did my study on James, my last video, for you to check it out. What actually is going on in James? We're not going to make it all different, complicated here stuff, and bring up my, my flow chart of my where my dispensations start and end and who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. It's quite simple. This is where the character of God changes, and this is where his half-brother takes over. Over here, because it's a totally different guy, because you're saved by works. See what I'm saying? There's, there's some problems with that when your character of God changes from dispensation to dispensation. Huge problems. As I was saying, with the Scott Clark and his crew, and their position is that the book of James is to tribulation saints or people getting saved out of the tribulation their further position is that everything from the book of hebrews all the way through revelation is also to the jews during the tribulation therefore it's not for christians so apparently the only books that a christian should read is the book of what romans because the other stuff that Paul did were actually to people in Corinth and the Corinthians. I never lived in Corinth. I never lived, to Galatia, lived in Galatia. Romans in there, he does say to the Romans and the Gentiles, and I guess I'm a Gentile, so I guess the book of Romans is the only thing that I, applies to me. But we're going to look at these and see. I'm, I'm curious where... It says that the people that Paul is speaking to, Peter is speaking to, Jude is speaking to, are, are, are lost Jews. Very important for this dispensational idea of works. Remember now, Hebrews through Revelation preaches a gospel of works. 
according to these dispensational people. <clears throat> it's if, if all dispensationalists, if this is like the core of dispensationalism, I am not a dispensationalist then. I don't want anything to do with this idea at all. And I don't want to make some of you mad, but it's lunacy. As I said, I would consider, I always considered this idea hyper dispensationalism. But maybe I just don't know enough about dispensationalism. I don't have my PhD in it. I'll just say that I'm not. Make it easy on me. Hebrews 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto fathers by the prophets, hath in these the last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, to whom we also made the worlds, and being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word in his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of his majesty on nigh. Purged our sins. Sounds like Paul is talking to saved people, doesn't it? Purged our sins. Kind of sounds like they're saved. Kind of still talks like they're, they're talking about the cross in the tribulation period. Again, if you have works in the tribulation period, what difference does Jesus' sacrifice make on the cross if it's works? James, our favorite. Servant of God and Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Well, it applies to nobody because it's the twelve tribes and the Jews don't even know who the twelve, tw twelve tribes are anymore. They're all doing DNA tests to try and figure it out because none of them know anymore. My brethren, uh-oh, they're saved too. Okay, I guess we got to move on. First Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, oh, apostle to the Jews, apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I'm sure there is no Gentiles in there at all that Paul is talking to in any of them places. Not one. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Sounds like these are saved people too. Second Peter. Simon Peter, a servant of the apostle Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. These are saved people too. They're not telling me to work here. These people are already saved, but I'm supposed to believe they're in the tribulation? 1 John. That which was in the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Sounds like they're saved. Second John. The elder unto the elect lady and hear thou children, whom I love in truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. For truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Saved people. This is not a message to tribulation people. Third John. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Saved person, beloved, I wish above all things that you mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. Hey, he's a saved guy who's walking the walk. All right, we're going to go to Jude. We're going to cover them all except Revelation here. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, we're all saved people. Where would somebody get the idea that James is speaking to lost people, therefore it's okay to stick the Jews in the tribulation period and say this is a message of works and faith to the Jews for the tribulation period? And not only that, but every book, Hebrews afterward, is to the Jews for the tribulation period. What kind of lunacy is this? Again, you can disagree with me all you want to. That's fine. You can leave nasty comments, thumbs down. 
unsub, whatever you want to. All I am doing is effectively as asking a question here. I am asking a question. If right now, nothing that I do can add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross, how can I add to it in the future? On another video, I'll just go through the Old Testament and see how is it possible that their works could add to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Were those works for their physical salvation and keeping with the covenant that they had with God? Or were they working their way to go to heaven? What were they doing? I don't really want to deal with that. That's Old Testament. I'll just let it slide because it's not for the church age. That's what I did for a long time. Even though myself, I was in that camp four years ago, five years ago. Oh yeah, Jews working, working for their salvation. Gradually slipped out of that where it's like, no, it doesn't make any sense. But I digress. In the New Testament, show me works. Show me works anywhere. Well, the mark of the beast, which is mentioned once. Where's my two or three witnesses? Where is it plainly state works in the New Testament? Any dispensation. We don't have it. And there's no such thing as faith plus works. None. Because if you're working, your faith is implied. It's works salvation. Works. And again, how fair is it of God to change the rules on you? How is that for character? Your works are as but filthy rags. But that's in this dispensation. Is that what's going to happen up in uh, White Throne Judgment? You're going to get there and then God's going to go, Well, Larkin should have explained this to you, that your works are as filthy rags during the church age, but you made it to the tribulation where, you know, your works were actually just the most precious stones to me. And you didn't do that, so you have to go to hell for eternity. I'm sorry. I think it's heresy. That's what I think. With that, we're going to be out of here.